How's it going everyone? This is my blank. Welcome back to my channel and I know I haven't uploaded anything in two weeks. I wanted to bring this Ryzen review somewhere close to its 2nd of March release date. But you see, I didn't get a review kit and that's okay. So I was at the mercy of the retail channels and while I had the CPU I bought my 1700X on day one, I waited for the motherboard, the Asus Crosshair 6 Hero, for 6 days to arrive. Since then I've been benchmarking like crazy almost non-stop to bring what I think is the most comprehensive Ryzen 1700X review so far. This video is a little longer than usual, so if you want to jump to a specific section, check the pinned comment down below. Also before going forward, if you enjoy the content, consider subscribing and check out my Twitter linked in the description. This is the Ryzen R7 1700X AMD's new CPU from its R7 processor lineup. AMD released on the 2nd of March three new CPUs, the Ryzen R7 1700, the 1700X and the 1800X desktop flagship. All of these parts are 8 core 16 threads multiplier unlocked SKUs based on their new Zen microarchitecture. Zen's been a long time coming and there was massive hype surrounding it for the past year or so, specifically since AMD showed its Blender demo and mentioned 40% increased IPC compared to Excavator. It looks like AMD not only reached its goal but actually surpassed that figure, quoting a massive 52% IPC increase from its already improved bulldozer based Excavator microarchitecture. This puts it within 0 to 2% to Intel's Broadwell EIPC and around 6 to 7% to KB Lakes. Ryzen is built on global. Global Foundry's 14 nanometer FinFET license from Samsung, and the shift to 14 nanometer is only part of the reason contributing to the low power consumption and TDP of the 1700X we have here today, alongside architecture improvements and general power efficient design, making this a 95 watt TDP skew. There seems to be a generally accepted way to design a powerful CPU microarchitecture these days and AMD is sticking to it. The die is essentially housing two 4-core A-thread CPUs called Core Complex CCX that are sharing 16 megabytes of L3 victim cache and a large 512 kilobytes of L2 inclusive cache. The two CCXs are tied together by the data fabric which we don't know a whole lot about as of now. Similar to Intel, Ryzen now supports simultaneous multi-thread SMT for short, giving it double the execution threads per core. This is built from scratch and there's a lot of new stuff added to this microarchitecture like the micro op cache, decoupled branch predictor, new instruction sets, support, etc. The gist of things is that Ryzen is built to scale well with different power envelopes and core counts, hence the upcoming lower power Ryzen R5 and R3 CPUs that will be released later in the year. Today I have the 1700X the middle of the road 8 core CPU. This comes with a base clock of 3.4 GHz, an 8 core boost to 3.5 GHz, a single core boost of 3.8 GHz that can go a notch higher to 3.9 GHz with the help of XFR, AMD's new technology that detects your cooling capabilities and extends this boost range for an extra 100 MHz only on X CPUs and 50 MHz on non X CPUs if the motherboard supports it. Also, the non-X CPUs don't come with a box cooler like the new Wraith RGB coolers designed for 95W TDP Wraith Spire and 140W the Wraith Max. I honestly don't know what I should be checking this CPU against. If I go by AMD or core count, then I should be benchmarking it against Intel's X99 platform 6850K or 6900K. If I go by price alone, then this is a little bit more expensive than the 7700K. Fortunately, the decision for me is easy. I do not own an X99 platform, but I do own a 7700K, so we'll check against that. I might be reaching into the depths of pedantry with my testing, but considering the huge drama surrounding the review of these processors, I think this is the right approach. So here on out I'll be detailing the testing methodology just so things are extra clear. Let's start with the common things between these platforms, the GPU. I'm using a loner GTX 1070 that overclocks higher than mine, to 2200 MHz core clock and 8900 MHz effective VRAM clock. This is the fastest GPU I could get my hands on for the moment. To ensure I stress the CPU as much as possible, I'm testing at 720p and then at 1080p to keep things more true to real world application as I can't see anyone gaming at 720p on this thing. Testing is not done on ultra settings, I'm using high settings for all games and both resolutions, which means down a notch from each game's quality setting. 
I ran tests at stock and then overclocked both processors, the 17700K to 5.0 GHz and the 1700X to 3.97 GHz, the highest it would go without a massive voltage bump. This required 1.3875 volts during load to be stable. I talked about the data fabric and one thing we know is that it runs at half the effective RAM speed, so running a high RAM frequency is important to ensuring better performance for Ryzen. I used G-Skill Trident Z 3600MHz CL16 RAM which I ran at 3200MHz CL14 on both platforms. This sounds much easier than it is for the current state of AM4 boards. It was a nightmare to get this thing working easily on the Crosshair 6. I'm running the latest 5704 EF5 for this, but the 3200MHz MEM strap will not work 9 times out of 10 if you're not also pushing the base clock. Eventually it will boot at 3200MHz and even beyond. With that without adjusting the BCLK from the default 100MHz and runs perfectly stable until probably the next few reboots. I think this will get fixed in the future though as the board is certainly capable, I even booted a 3600MHz RAM with it and it was perfectly fine and stable. For the 3.97GHz overclock on the Ryzen chip I used a combination of multiplier and BCLK overclock of 101.8MHz ending up with 3257MHz CL14 RAM clock in the process. The bulk of tests were done on fresh, fully updated Windows 10 installs running in high performance mode for both platforms. I also tested 4 titles in Windows 7 as there are some Windows 10 issues with the scheduler thread bouncing between the CCXs, L3 cache not read properly i.e. thinking each core has 8MB of L3 instead of 2MB and other mishaps that hopefully Microsoft will be releasing an update sooner rather than later. Some people have been reporting better performance on 7 and I I wanted to test this for myself. To ensure full compatibility between these two Windows platforms, since Presentmon doesn't work on Windows 7, I tested these four titles separately with fraps on both Windows 10 and 7 to ensure data coherency in my results. And since there's reported problems with Windows 10 and Ryzen, I also tested with SMT off at 3.97GHz to see if this actually improves things. And finally before we start the massive benchmark section, to cool the 1700X I used the Noctua NHD15S which Noctua were kind enough to send it my way alongside their AM4 mounting bracket to use for my Ryzen testing and upcoming build. This is a massive heatsink and I'm fully utilizing its capabilities running those 1.3875V. Let's start the show now. First off it's the productivity benchmarks. I'll start slow with a much leaked CPU-Z single and multi-threaded benchmark. Things are pretty cut and dry on the single core performance for the 5GHz 7700K, much so how they are on the multi-threaded for the 1700X. Next up is Cinebench R15 again with single and multi-threaded numbers. I use Cinema 4D in my project and I know how a slow CPU will make things chug, so more cores the merrier. I tested WinRAR with 1.5GB of files ranging from the extremely small and many to larger 50MB MP4 clips and a lot of 1MB images. I used normal compression on it running off of an SSD as for all tests you see here. Dolphin emulator is single threaded and scales very well with IPC and frequency so naturally the 7700K at 5GHz with a bit higher IPC and a 1GHz lead takes the cake. I also use Handbrake quite a lot and transcode 4K to 1080p. This runs arguably faster on Ryzen with a hefty chunk of time cut out of big project rendering. Povray is not something that I use but scales with as many cores and threads you're running and again Ryzen takes the cake with less time and more pixels per second rendered. Last but not least is Passmark CPU testing where it's a clear win for the 8 core 16 thread Ryzen CPU. Ok, now we have a rough idea of how powerful this thing is, so it's time to see how gaming fares on it. I'll start with Windows 10, 1080p and 720p testing where I used averages and 5% low frame rates, the average of the lowest 5% of frames. Each game will also have 1080p and 720p frame time analysis. Following that is something new to game performance testing at least on this channel, bell curves for frame rates to gauge frame rate distribution, so stick around for that as it's going to be interesting. Lastly we'll take a look at Windows 7 vs Windows 10 performance. Battlefield 1 is my first game here and you can see the benchmark runs in the background for all tested titles. I won't talk about each game in particular as you can see the results for yourselves, but I'll talk about my general gaming experience on Ryzen. There's games where it can stand to up to a 5GHz 7700K and there's games where the i7 takes a lead. 
Is this not to be expected considering that 1. Most games are oblivious to more than 8 threads and 2. It's running a massive 1GHz lead and 5GHz OC is according to latest SiliconLottery.com statistics a 50-50 chance to reach on a 7700K. This also has a bit of an IPC lead at 6-7%. So this was to be expected even if some people say that they are entitled to have these expectations for a CPU that is a bit more expensive than the 7700K. Their argument doesn't nullify, however, the reality of hard clocks of KB Lake. I'll have more details on this in the last part of the review, but this is my quick take on unrealistic expectations. As you'll note, I mostly used DX11 in tests, since this puts more stress on the CPU through larger API overhead. That's why there's limited DX12 testing, after all you want me to stress the CPU to see how it performs, right? Also, 720p is missing in Ashes on the Singularity, as I'm using the CPU Focus preset, and even at 1080p it's 100% CPU bound. The actual GPU utilization is around 55 to 60 percent. And the other title that's missing 720p testing is Doom, as I was hitting the frame rate cap consistently with both the 1700X and the 17700K, so I excluded it. All in all, Ryzen is more than apt for 1080p gaming. There are notable exceptions like Rise of the Tomb Raider, specifically Geothermal Valley, which is extremely and unjustly, in my opinion, CPU heavy, which performs slower on the 1700. X. Switching to DX12 Ryzen is more competitive though, as you will see. Also worth noting is that in this game's non-CPU intensive areas, the 1700X is performing on par with the 7700K. Also tested with SMT disabled to see if I get improved performance. In my case, I did not. I actually retested some titles since I had different expectations, but the results were within margin of error each time. I am very confident in my results and I stick 100% by them. SMT in my tests did not yield better performance. I got the best results running the full 16 threads no matter how limited the game engine was. This does not mean that Windows 10 doesn't exhibit some serious mismanagement of Ryzen CPUs, that's pretty much confirmed by now. There's also been some people reporting smoother gameplay after switching to Ryzen. Well, if you check out some 5% lows in a few titles, they are higher than on the 7700K. This is potentially one reason, but averages never tell the full story. I needed to test this so I had to think of a way to transpose that smoother feeling in actual numbers. So I chose a bell curve that shows the actual frame rate distribution. On these graphs you can see how many frames there are between a certain interval. What you should be looking for is to have a narrow bell shaped curve with a nice peak. This means that frame rates are grouped up essentially giving you a smoother game feel. Sometimes Ryzen has a better curve, sometimes the 7700K. Some games simply are badly optimized and there 
there is no bell curve, it's all over the place. This is usually not the CPU but the actual game. Check these out at your own pace, they're a very interesting metric indeed. Lastly, we have Windows 7 testing in which I did not have high hopes after my SMT disable test did not show improvements. You cannot imagine how difficult getting Windows 7 on this machine was. It can only be done as of right now by injecting the necessary USB drivers into the Windows image prior to install. Otherwise, you'll have no mouse or keyboard unless you run a PS2 keyboard and your motherboard obviously has a PS2 connector. The Crosshair 6 Hero doesn't have one. Anyhow, I only tested in 4 games just to see if there's better performance. I can tell you for certain that Watch Dogs 2, for example, runs worse on 7. The beginning of the test was showing constantly above 100 FPS on 720p in Windows 10 and it never jumped over 85 on Windows 7. I also found GTA 5 performing much better on the Intel and Windows 7, so there's that. Windows 7 was run in high performance mode up to date and everything else kept the same for consistency's sake, drivers, RAM speeds etc. I saw very nice temperatures at stock on the 1700X, 48 to 54 Celsius while gaming at stock is excellent. However, throwing 1.3875 volts at 3.97 GHz is either pushing the limits of this NHD15S or I'm unlucky again and have a hot chip. It's running at an acceptable 65 to 74 Celsius during gaming but reaches 94 Celsius after a few minutes in stress testing. I can improve on this by using Liquid Metal Tem but right now I'm using Noctua's NT H1, a thermal paste that is by no means bad. For power usage I was seeing great results at both stock and overclocked for the 1700X. This is total system power draw including one CPU fan and six SSDs. It's really refreshing seeing low power draw numbers from AMD again and I cannot wait to see Raven Ridge APUs and the mobile CPUs. I can safely say that this is something that no one really expected from Zen. I'll avoid issuing conclusions. There's enough data in this video for anyone to draw their own. What I can say is that everyone needs to wait for software fixes to roll out as well as better EFIs. I see some definite strange disparity between Ryzen's performance in general productivity testing and gaming, at least in some titles. If this is indeed down to something specific on the software side, we'll see in the coming weeks. If you ask me, the biggest improvements will not come from these patches but rather from game developers adding Ryzen support to existing games and I also believe that games being released from now on will start running better and better as they'll cater to Ryzen from the get-go and also start getting more and more parallel. I for one am happy with the CPU's gaming performance and am taken aback by the raw power in productivity tasks. I use Handbrake a lot, WinRAR for archiving, Cinema 4D, AutoCAD, video editing software etc and the extra cores help sometimes a lot. There's also the rather neat fact that I can use a threads for handbrake rendering in the background while still having good performance while scrubbing videos in Premiere Pro for example or After Effects. If you've made it this far you are a true soldier and I commend you, I hope it was worth it. I cannot wait to see Ryzen get better with software updates, better EFIs, faster RAM support and game developer patches. And then onwards to Zen 2 where the only thing I'm wishing is better overclocks, I'm wishing for 4.5 GHz fingers crossed. Anyway, I want to see your comments, questions and suggestions down below as usual and thank you for supporting this channel by subscribing. See you next time everybody, bye bye.